to begin with, I'd like to mention once again, Iowa City was founded in 1839, and it grew rapidly using local building materials such as limestone. And lumber was easy enough to procure from a vast number of nearby trees, and early log cabins were constructed. Fruits and vegetables could be grown locally and marketed. Sylvanus Johnson, Iowa City's first brick maker, was recruited by territorial governor Robert Lucas to travel to the Iowa Territory Missouri border to fight in the so-called Honey War. The war was actually over before it began and the northern border of Missouri, which was in dispute, was later settled. Johnson settled in Iowa City and established his brick making operation where the present day Northwest Bell Building is located on Burlington Street. He supplied brick for the construction of many homes, as well as the interior walls of the old Capitol, and other brickmakers followed. So what was not to have in Iowa City that could be produced locally? One could list a thousand things, nails, cotton for spinning in the fabric, books for reading and study, paper, pencils, the list goes on. So how to get these things to Iowa City? What were the means of transporting cargo to town in 1840? There were some railroads out east. There were canals, such as the Erie Canal out east, but there were no motorized vehicles, no trucks, no major means of transportation in Iowa City. But there were stagecoaches. Yes, Iowa City had stagecoach service and even built stagecoaches in the 600 block of East Iowa Avenue. The first stagecoach arrived in Iowa City in 1840, running between Bloomington, now called Muscatine, and Iowa City. But how much cargo could a stagecoach transport? And stagecoaches could not convey large, heavy cargo. How good were the primitive dirt roads of the day in rainy and snowy weather? It was touch and go for reliable road transport. Should mention too that there were not only stagecoaches, but wagons were used to transport the goods. And those no doubt were the principal means by which the goods were conveyed to Iowa City. Well, people in Iowa City knew about steamboats and wondered if they could ply the Iowa River to deliver cargo here. Steamboats, some quite large, sailed the Ohio and Mississippi rivers and could transport a great deal of cargo on those larger waterways. In the mid-1800s, the Mississippi River was much shallower than today. Think about why. In fact, it was said that a person could wade across it in many or most places. It was much later in the 1800s that the so-called wing dams were put in place, deepening the main channel. And in the 1930s, when the series of locks and dams were built, not for flood control, but to deepen the channel for barge traffic, at least a 12 foot deep channel was maintained. But the steamboats drew very little water and were able to navigate over shallow rivers. Could a steamboat reach Iowa City? By 1836, Albert Lee said yes. Albert Lee, for whom the city in southern Minnesota is named, was a topographer with the United States Dragoons. Dragoons were a class of mounted soldiers who used horses for mobility, but dismounted to fight on foot. In 1835, Lee surveyed southern Minnesota and northern Iowa. Captain Nathan Boone, a son of Daniel Boone, was the scout for Lee's unit. Boone and Boone County, Iowa, were named for this son of Daniel Boone. Well, Lee said the current on the Iowa River was rapid and had frequent sandbars and snags, and that the channel often changed position. But he thought the main river could be easily navigated during three or four months of the year if steamboats were, with light draft were used. This could be done at least as far upriver to what would become Iowa City. Steamboats were nothing new in 1840. The first commercially successful steamboat was developed by Robert Fulton and plied the waters of the Hudson River in New York in 1807. And even in the early 1700s, patents had been issued for steam-powered watercraft. One author told of a steamboat making the first trip from Pittsburgh down the Ohio and Mississippi rivers 
to New Orleans in January of 1812, taking nearly three months. In 1837, a steamboat tried to make its way up the Des Moines River, but was stopped by sandbar shortly after the beginning of the trip. The first steamboat on the Iowa River was the, called the Science, and during low water conditions in the fall of 1837, it ascended the Iowa to Wapalo. This is what a typical 1850s river paddle steamer on the Mississippi River looked like, a good sized boat. I'm missing something here for some reason. There it is. I've got the ripple out of sequence. That's my fault. Anyway, we'll get to the ripple in just a moment. Here's the Iowa River between Iowa City and, and the Mississippi River in the dark blue here that I put in. Over that course, it is about 65 miles. And here's the Cedar River between Cedar Rapids and the Iowa River. On June 18, 1841, a steamboat called the Ripple landed at the junction of the Iowa and Cedar Rivers. But the Ripple continued on up the Iowa River and landed at Iowa City two days later on the 20th. The landing place was where Iowa Avenue meets the river and henceforth this spot became known as the Steamboat Landing. I think the name promoted by one of the newspapers. This is not the ripple, as no images could be found, but perhaps this steamer looks something like the ripple. When the ripple landed at Iowa City, the old Capitol building was being built. It had no roof, but the town had many houses, stores, and inns that had sprung up in just two short years since the founding of the city. The Iowa City Standard, a newspaper, declared rival extraordinary. The Standard further reported that the arrival of the Ripple resulted in, quote, hearty cheers and a warm welcome for the captain, crew, and passengers. On arrival in Iowa City, the level of the Iowa River was comparatively low, which was expected to silence any naysayers about steamship travel on the Iowa River. Many of you heard me talk about Frederick Macy Irish. He was one of the first settlers in Iowa City. Born out east, he was a sailor on a whaling ship out of Nantucket and later a New York Harbor pilot. And he liked to be called Captain. He was chosen to board the Ripple to help scout out any obstructions in the river and to figure out how to remove those obstructions. The day after the Ripple landed, the Committee of Iowa Cityans invited the captain, crew, and passengers of the Ripple to a public dinner in their honor. Speeches and toasts were offered to enliven the festivities. Concerning the Ripple, one declared, quote, she was to begin a new era for Iowa City. Although we were less than three years old, she and her sister craft would make us feel free of bad roads, wobbly bridges, slow wagons, and stagecoaches. We would be linked by the river highway with Burlington, New Orleans, even London. End of quote. There was tremendous excitement about the arrival of this steamboat. The Ripple's captain was a Mormon and a resident of Nauvoo, Illinois, and several years later he went with the Great Migration to Utah. The Ripple never returned to Iowa City. Preceding the Ripple's journey to Iowa City, it made a trip up the Cedar River to Rochester in 1838. Over the course of the 10 months following the arrival of the Ripple, the hopes that it inspired in the Iowa Cityans faded without their fulfillment. And on November 24, 1841, the Ripple struck a rock and sank near Galena, Illinois, no doubt on the Mississippi River. On April 21, 1842, the Rock River arrived at the Iowa River landing. And shortly after, it made a trip about 12 miles upstream to the stone quarries. On board were about 150 passengers, including some ladies who were, quote, dressed in splendid attire. 
The passengers reported that they witnessed workmen quarrying stone for the old capital. The Iowa City Standard declared, the citizens of the city turned out en masse. This demonstrated beyond a doubt the entire practicality of steamboat navigation on the Iowa River at an ordinary stage. The Iowa Capitol reporter called the Rock River a medium-sized boat in the upper Mississippi trade. Eight days later, on April 29, 1841, the Rock River returned to Iowa City with a load of freight and passengers, having traveled from Bloomington, that is Muscatine, in one day. Now I've got my dates wrong here because I said April of 1842, and now I just said 41, and I don't know what's correct. I think it's 41, though. Well, before any other steamboat arrived, the Walter Terrell Mill Dam, across from the present-day Mayflower, was built, blocking the river off. Also, the Iowa City Manufacturing Company erected its dam in Coralville. These dams were built without consideration of there being a hindrance for possible future navigation. On March 12, 1844, the Agatha landed at Iowa City. She was a stern wheeler that weighed 46 tons and was 119 feet long. That's a pretty good sized boat. And it was 19 feet wide and had a depth of hold of three feet. How much water did it draw? Don't know found no accountings of how much water these boats drew, but there must have been very little. We'll just have to pretend that this, is, this was the Agatha. It was reported that she brought a considerable amount of freight and made the return trip to St. Louis with 15 to 20 passengers and a load of pork, hemp, and wheat. The amount of cargo is considered a disappointment because much pork and wheat had already been sent overland to Mississippi ports. The Agatha never returned to Iowa City. Shambaugh reported that, quote, it was said that freight by water way cost one half less than by wagon way. I'll have more to say about Shambaugh. I think I do anyway. Maybe I'm thinking somebody else. Anyway, I'm sorry. The Maid of Iowa. Okay. The fourth steamboat to arrive at Iowa City was the Maid of Iowa, which docked on se Sunday, September 2nd, 1844, uh, June 2nd. So just a couple of months after the Agatha. This boat was built in Augusta, Iowa. That's down in southeast Iowa in 1842. Augusta is a small settlement about 10 miles west of Burlington. It's on the Skunk River. And here is a pencil sketch of the Maid of Iowa. It was a 60-ton craft, 115 feet long and 18 feet wide, and had a three-foot hold. She was apparently the first steamboat built in Iowa, perhaps thus the name. The same captain who piloted the Ripple commanded the Maid of Iowa. He favored some Iowa Cityans with an excursion of a few miles up and down the Iowa River and then left with, left with a full freight plus a keel boat attached to his boat. On July 5th, the Maid of Iowa returned to Iowa City. The next day it departed with a cargo of produce bound for Nauvoo, Illinois and on September 1st, it made a third trip to Iowa City. And upon its departure, she was loaded with wheat bound for St. Louis. Fully loaded, the maid was capable of hauling approximately 40 tons of freight and 200 passengers. She could make five to eight miles per hour with the current and nearly two thirds that speed when going upstream. And it carried a crew of 17. So it was a pretty good sized boat. The Maid of Iowa sailed on, quote, nearly all of the principal rivers of eastern Iowa, end quote, and many of these rivers were not considered navigable. According to Dr. William Peterson, that's the man I'm going to talk about later, the Maid was owned by Joseph Smith of Nauvoo. You know the name Joseph Smith? He held it in trust for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The Emma was a stern wheeler. I haven't read about any side wheelers. The stern wheeler, and it was built in Pittsburgh in 1842. It made the Iowa City landing on June 22nd, 1844. It was said to be the largest craft that visited Iowa City. It was 66 tons, 127 feet long, 18 feet wide, and three feet deep. It carried salt, 
groceries and so forth. It left for Bloomington and Burlington loaded with freight. The next year, 1845, in May, the Iowa City Capitol reporter announced an invitation for people to witness the launch of a new steamboat from the boat yard. The boat yard was one half mile below Iowa City that built boats. This was called the Reveille. Quote, the public was urged to buy shares in the Reveille at $25 each. It was noted that the engine <clears throat> of this new boat was designed by one of the proprietors and it was expected to revolutionize the motive power of all steamers on the Western rivers. End of quote. Never heard any more about that. She would run on a semi-weekly basis between Burlington and Iowa City and would carry both freight and passengers. I found no record of its sailings, however. In 1854, we're jumping way ahead now, about a decade, the steamship, the Badger State, was ready for service on the Iowa River, intending to make regular runs between Iowa City and St. Louis. I did not find a record of its sailings either. Well, concerning other boat building, meantime, boat building was a profitable business in Iowa City. In 1847, half a dozen flatboats were being constructed at the boat yard, and in 1848, a big new barge was ready here, 130 feet long, 21 feet wide, and able to carry 180 tons. It's a lot. And I might mention, just as a reminder, back in the early 1840s, flatboats were probably being used to carry the stone from the quarries down to the Iowa City Old Capital area. Well, the swan song of Iowa City steamboat days was the short career of the Iowa City, launched in April of 1866. The maiden run was that of leaving Iowa City for New Boston on July 6. The proprietors announced that regular trips would be made, connecting with other boats on the Mississippi and with the railroad at Burlington. A number of runs were made, but the Iowa City was then destroyed by fire. This ended the steamboat era in Iowa City. And just jumping ahead, 1866 was 10 years after the arrival of the railroad. Now concerning steamboating on other Eastern Iowa rivers, here's an image of the Black Hawk, which was a steamboat that traveled on the Cedar River between Cedar Rapids, Vinton and Waterloo in the 1850s. The Black Hawk made 29 round trips between Cedar Rapids and Waterloo in just 1859. Steamboat operations on the Cedar River exceeded those on the Iowa River, both in the number of boats employed and in the distances traveled. Two steamboats, the Hero and the Pavilion, traveled the Des Moines River to Fort Des Moines in 1837. Fort Des Moines was the forerunner of the city of Des Moines. Before the Civil War, 30 steamboats traveled to Des Moines. I got a kick out of the information from a website concerning helpful hints for steamboat passengers. It was apparently aimed at passengers on Mississippi River steamboats. I quote a few of them here. The misguided fail to understand how the railroad is against God's holy law of nature. But if the public is well informed, the railroad will soon disappear like other passing fads. Warning. Thieves, con agents, and gamblers ride the steamboats. Many of these undesirable citizens hang around levees, wharves, hotels, and taverns in the river towns. If you need to carry a large sum of money, wear a money belt. Avoid games of chance on the river boats. Sometimes there are only two wash basins, one with one hairbrush, a comb, and community toothbrush, and a roller-type towel. The crews keeps the picture, pitchers filled with river water. The toilets are like the outdoor variety. Sometimes they are placed over the paddle wheel. Other times they are built next to the wheel. Most steamboat captains load the cargo, including animals, on the deck first. Then the deck passengers scramble for the space that is left. Deck passengers are in constant danger from possible boiler explosions. Escaping steam from broken pipes may scald the passengers. 
If the boat is too crowded, passengers may be shoved overboard. In case the boat sinks, deck passengers may be trapped by the cargo. And a final one, if there are ladies or girls in your traveling party, avoid contacts with the deck crew. They are a rough lot with many thieves among them. So after this short presentation, because there really isn't a lot, the arrival of the Ripple in 1841 created quite a stir. The citizens of Iowa City were all aglow and declared the steamboat the answer to their dreams. It was a panacea, but it was not to be. Although several steamboats successfully made their way to, way to Iowa City, able to convey cargo to and fro, the era of the steamboat was not long lasting. It was not a reliable steady means of transportation on the Iowa River. Ray Anderson of the Iowa Geological Survey said, quote, the Iowa River, like so many of the smaller rivers in Iowa, was too shallow, too prone to shifting its course, and too rocky in places to be useful for river traffic. After ice from the severe winter of 1842 through 43 tore up most of the landing areas on the Iowa River in Iowa City, people realized that river travel never would be dependable. To put things in the words of William Peterson, all in all, less than a dozen steamboats are known to have plied the Iowa River between Iowa City and the Mississippi. The river was shallow, full of bars and snags, and navigation was so difficult that steamboats could only ascend during high water. The coming of the railroad made steamboats unnecessary. The Mississippi and Missouri Railroad reached Iowa City at the end of 1855. William Peterson was known as Steamboat Bill because of his longtime interest in researching steamboats. He hitchhiked 20,000 miles over a three year period in his quest to gather information along the Mississippi and Ohio rivers. Peterson was a prolific writer of Iowa history, authoring 11 books and over 400 articles. He was the curator of the State Historical Society for 25 years, and during his tenure, the Iowa City Historical Society building was financed and constructed. I wanted to visit the State Historical Society building in an attempt to get some more information on steamboating, but of course the building remains closed to visitors due to COVID. Thanks for listening.